Okay, so we will complete the gas radiation problem involving a spherical cavity where we had a mixture of carbon dioxide, water vapor and nitrogen which was a 2 atmosphere, 41 problem number, 400 Kelvin, right? 500. It is a black wall, right? Huh? I gave it to be a black wall, right? Mm. So, yesterday we looked at the charts repeatedly and arrived at the epsilon g that is the emissivity of the gas. So, Epsilon G was 0 0.36, huh? now we will have to so we have to get alpha G, yeah. The first step is to get uh, Uh, can you tell me all these values? So, you have to basically employ the same procedure except that there will be a normalizing factor called T s by T g which takes care of the ratio of the two temperatures and you have to say, apply the use the same charts. Yeah, shall you go one by one? What is the absorptivity of the carbon dioxide? Did we work it out yesterday? Ah. Okay, point zero two five. The correction factors are the same, right? Ah. Where, where did same correction factors? Same correction factors to be used. No? Ah. What are what are the correction factors? One point one and one point five sum. Get what is? It? Okay, so we got this. Delta alpha we worked out yesterday, right? That was easy. Huh? Okay, just get me the alpha of the water vapor and we are done. So, delta alpha is almost 0, right? right? Hmm, very small. You can use that. Okay, so we use the same charts. Okay, gas emittance for CO2, the same chart we use for getting alpha of CO2. Page 2, page 3, we get alpha of water vapor. So, you have to find out the PC into PW into LM and then get the gas temperature and then get, get the alpha w. How much was it? Alpha w? Uh, 0.15. 0.15, is that correct? Others please check this. Uh. 
Yeah. No, 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 no. I didn't want you to say, tell me that. This is alpha c from the chart. Okay. I want this from charts. Okay. Don't go to the. From charts, what are the values? Zero two, huh? Ah. Uh, alpha, whatever we should be high. I expect it to be point three. Ah, uh, I expect it to be high. Point three, Vikram. I'm not. Uh, I don't want the post process values. I don't want the post process values. We are doing step by step. Okay. So show me what formula did we write yesterday? This is epsilon c plus is basically. For I'll define for no, that C C was not there. That we are already calculating no, based on that. No, no, there is a notational problem here. I gave you alpha c equal to epsilon c O2 plus into T G by T S to the power of okay. Okay, so shall we put this as star? Huh? This no problem. This is actually epsilon of CO2 and this thing got the corrected temperature. That is all. Huh? You have to find use this scaled up parameters while you finding the alpha itself. The yeah, yeah. And then, but then we are again uh, multiplying by Tg by Ts. Yeah, yeah. You guys are no, no scaled up. Okay, I want only the directly from the chart. First, directly read from the chart with Ts by Tg and tell me. Then we will go step by step now. Directly from the chart, what do you get? That is 0 0.04. Which one? After that, you multiply the Tg by Ts. No, no, leave it. And the correction factor. No, no, I do not before multiplying by correction factor, before everything. 0 .04. Huh? 0 0.04, this one. Do not multiply anything because uh, some somebody else is seeing the program. So, first reading from the chart, what is the value? We will multiply step by step. Nah? Don't. Yeah, that is fair. You have F6, F7, whatever I have given, that has to be multiplied. Correct. Corresponding to that alpha u. Huh? Point not? Which one? Alpha C. Okay, alpha w. Correct. Alpha C plus multiplied by that. Uh, power. Yeah. Yeah. What is this now? This is the procedure. Okay. First, get without multiplying any scaling factor, whatever. Likewise. This will be Tg by Th to the power of 0.45. Ah. Because I was expecting an alpha of W of 0.6. Are you getting? Okay. Sorry, alpha of alpha g of 
if I have given the formula after that is if I have given the correction factor afterwards you take care of do not do the correction factor twice at the same time do not forget to apply it once okay. basically it is like that the correction factors have to be applied once T g by T s to the power of 0.65 and 0.45 have to be multiplied once and then T s by T g has to be taken for reading the charts only three principles involved L m T L m into P c that is all right. do not do something twice and do not omit. Um, see, is it clear? Finally, what was this? Point six, ah? Huh? Ampat, what is it? Alpha, alpha W, point alpha G. Six point six. Point six. Four. Point six four. Wait. Huh? Point six four. Oh, right. Hmm. So, the most important thing you realize is epsilon g is not equal to alpha g, okay. epsilon g is not equal to alpha g, it is not a grey gas, we cannot simply calculate epsilon g and proceed with the calculation, so we will be stumped. So, the mixture of carbon dioxide and water vapour is a non grey gas, okay. that is why it is good that these people develop, Hotel develop these charts. Now, we can do solve the equation of transfer numerically and get this. Okay, but this was done in 1945. Lot of things developed during World War II, including war, right? Okay. So now we got the. What is the cooling rate required to maintain this fellow at 500 Kelvin or 400 Kelvin? 500 Kelvin. That means we want. Four pi r square. Huh? Is that correct? Hmm. Sphere. So this is the cooling rate required to maintain it at five hundred Kelvin. Now J one is easy. One is the wall. There are no two surfaces in this enclosure. It's only a single surface enclosure. I gave black wall, isn't it? Okay, fine. How much is this? Okay, leave it. We'll shall we derive the generic generic formula first. Okay, we'll derive the. Now, what is G one? It is gas radiation epsilon g f i j j j tau 1 tau i j there is only one enclosure there is only one surface okay the other one is gas therefore and f 1 2 is not there f 1 1 equal to F11 equal to 1, the sphere sees itself fully and tau 1 2 can be taken to be tau of the gas, correct. You can call it as tau g therefore plus so. Now, what is this tau g? We cannot put 1 minus kappa L12 by, by because that was for grey gas and all that. 1 minus alpha g. We did so much, so much struggle we undertook to calculate alpha g, right. So, we can say that because alpha g plus tau g plus rho g equal to 1 huh, for the gas also, we do not worry about this fellow now. Therefore, tau g 
equal to 1 minus alpha g. Therefore, So, if it is a single surface enclosure involving gas radiation, if it is a mixture of these gases, right? In the exam, you can straight away use this final formula, you do not have to derive. Alpha g sigma t to the power of 4 minus epsilon g sigma t g to the power of 4. This is a standard formula, it will be given in several textbooks, but we derived it using enclosure theory in today's class, correct? If you see a book by Holman or Uzisik. He will work out radiation, gas radiation problem straight away by taking this formula. Okay. Yeah, put in the values. Get me the value of Q1. What is alpha G? 0 alpha g plus epsilon equal to 1 is it no, that is strange okay mm. <laughs> it need not happen always uh. yeah kilowatts minus of course it is minus isn't it minus sure Kilowatt per meter square, is it correct? I did not reverse it, 138 kilowatt, Q1 you are not getting that compass. Thousand four hundred. Okay, minus seventy six point. So, so Q equal to What is the what does it tell you? What does it tell you? We need to cool, cool. that is okay, it is pretty straightforward. Otherwise, this uh, this fellow will get heated, he will also reach 1500 Kelvin, provided an inexhaustible supply of gases available. More importantly, more importantly, in this spherical cavity, if you put ethane or propane or LPG or butane, burn it, allow it to reach a temperature of 1500 Kelvin okay, and you get a mixture of CO2, H2O and N2. It is possible to send tubes, it is possible to put tubes on the outside of the spherical cavity, send water and heat water at the rate of 60 kilowatts. 
this is the power which is this is the radiative heat transfer power which the gas is capable of transferring to the wall. So, this is as you can see this will be very important in furnace calculations design of radiant superheaters and stuff like that. So, it is important in so it has got engineering applications ok. Of course, you have got if different surfaces are at different temperatures some of the surfaces are insulated and all that then we are going to be in a lot of trouble that question will arise tau of 1 2 tau g which from which T s by T g with respect to with respect to which surface and all that. So, we will stop our calculations based on gas and one surface that is all ok. So, this brings us finally to the end of radiative heat transfer. So, it has taken 3 months. So, 3 out of 75 percent of the course has been radiation and I think we did about uh, we had 33, 34 classes I think you got a good account starting from radiation loss to radiation properties then u factors then enclosure theory, enclosure theory for uh, non gray surf where we used a spectral radiosity distribution and a band, band model. Then we introduced the equation of radiative transfer gas in absorbing and emitting medium and we got a analytical solutions to the equation of transfer solved simple problems like uh, in two parallel plates and then we found out what happens for the case of a radiative equilibrium and then how to calculate emissivity and absorptivity for a gas mixture, how to apply it in a engineering problem. So, the last few classes what we have taught what we have seen basically comes under the uh, category of engineering treatment of gas radiation because this is an engineering treatment it is a recipe it is a very quick way of solving problems by using charts getting the properties and this uh, the actual the complete detailed way would be to solve the equation of transfer for various spectra and then work out the gas there is no need to define an overall absorptivity and transmissivity in that case. Then you will work out the intensity or the flux in each of these intervals and integrate ok. Now, we will finally start conduction transfer. So, we will have about 9 or 10 classes let us see what we can do because conduction itself I can teach for 45 hours right. So, it is also an exhaustive subject. Now, this class we will just see the introduction. I will make this material available on Moodle uh, by Monday ok. So, did we see the three ba introduction to the three modes of heat transfer in the first class? I explained to you about conduction right uh, ok. So, heat transfer is basically energy transfer between two bodies solely due to temperature difference ok. However, uh, that has to be taken with a pinch of salt because radiative heat transfer will take place even when temperature difference is not there radiation will take place so long as temperature is above 0 Kelvin ok. So, applications are uh, applications are I mean the applications of heat transfer are far too many starting from micro scale boiling to space radiators the applications are legion importance the design of heat exchangers energy conservation devices cooling of laptops cooling of personal digital assistants cooling of iPad iPhone cooling of data center cooling of cray supercomputer ok then uh, cooling of uh, re-entry vehicle such that the inside compartment is, uh, is ok for the astronauts. So, everywhere this even there is a the lung is the best mass transfer device right it gives a maximum surface area for a given volume. You must have seen in a heat transfer course that an important performance metric for the compactness of a heat exchanger is how many meter square surface area is available for per meter cube nobody can beat the lungs no device can beat the lungs. So, right. So, <coughs> there, there is heat transfer everywhere ok. So, <coughs> this is basically the importance the importance can never be overstated because because it is very very important ok. So, <laughs> the relationship the relationship between heat transfer and thermodynamics we have already seen. So, the Q is one of the three terms which occurs in the first law of thermodynamics q is an interaction occurring at the q is an interaction occurring at the surface w is an interaction occurring at the surface the difference between these two is can be explained by a property called energy or the change in energy right if for a closed cycle the energy need not be introduced. So, you introduce the concept of energy for a non cyclic process similarly you introduce the concept of entropy for a non cyclic process ok. So, the the foundations of heat transfer are based on 
both theory and experiment. The foundation of any science will be based on both theory and experiment. The theory is basically physical laws in terms of various concepts based on experimental observations. So, we have two types of laws, the general laws which are independent of the medium and particular laws which are dependent on the media. So, the general laws which are applicable for conduction heat transfer are basically the law of conservation of mass, the first law of thermodynamics, second law of thermodynamics. You can say A, B, C, D are applicable to all heat transfer problems. First law of thermodynamics, second law of thermodynamics and Newton second law of motion. Second law of thermodynamics is not very frequently used in heat transfer. It gives us the direction of the flow of heat, but second law analysis can be used for several heat transfer systems to find out whether you are doing certain things efficiently from the entropy point of view. Okay, so every system has an associated entropy generation, right? So whether you are minimizing the total entropy generated in a particular process or in a device, basically if you do that, it's a second law. You can see that the first law and second law would be sufficient; it would suffice for most conduction problems because invariably there is no mass entering and no which is mass which is leaving the system in a conduction problem and then the Newton second law of motion is not there mostly. Can you give me some examples where the body is moving in a conduction problem? The body is moving or the heat source is moving? The heat source which causes the conduction or the body is moving, but uh, no convection. The re-entry vehicle or a space application whatever, so the body is moving, there is a velocity and then you have got a convective boundary condition or a, the, the boundary condition will come because of uh, mv squared by 2, mv squared by 2 is stopped and is converted to kinetic converted enthalpy on the surface. So, these applications the body is moving, can you give me some applications where the source is moving? If you are welding and you are moving the welding rod, that is where the heat source is there. So, the, it is a moving heat source problem, okay. it is a moving heat source problem. So, there are problems in which the heat source of the body move, but these are exceptions in conduction heat transfer. The general rule is that the body is not moving. The particular laws are three laws, the Fourier's law of heat conduction, Fourier's law of heat conduction basically for conduction heat transfer, the Newton's law of cooling for the convective heat transfer, and the Stefan Boltzmann's law of radiation for the uh, radiative heat transfer. All these are particular laws which are not universally applicable, right. They are, up, they are applicable only in specific situations. So, if, if you apply the Fourier's law of heat conduction and the Newton's second law on to your first and second law of thermodynamics, it is possible for you to derive the general heat conduction equation, okay. Then finally, you can say that the body is not moving that will give, give rise to your Poisson equation, Laplace equation, then one dimensional heat equation and so on, right. It is possible to apply Fourier's law of heat conduction and Newton's law of cooling to the law of conservation of mass, first law, second law and Newton's second law of motion. What do you get? You get the Navier-Stokes equation, you get the Navier-Stokes equation and the equation of energy, okay. Radiation we do not do, radiation is separate. Please remember that the equation of transfer is not an energy equation. Even the problem which we solved in the last class, there is no equilibrium there. That means it, uh, the RT equation is not a standalone equation, it gives rise to a source or a sink, right. So, it has to be solved in conjunction with a in a in conjunction with, with a uh, equation where some property is conserved. Are you able to appreciate? So, in a combined conduction radiation problem, you have to solve the conduction equation, there will be a source term for radiation. If you want to calculate that source term, you have to stop the conduction calculations and do your radiative calculations and go back, okay. So, if you combine this particular loss with the general loss, you get new subjects, okay. If you combine these loss with this, you get conduction heat transfer. If you combine this with this, you will get convective heat transfer. If you combine this with this and you will say that uh, d i by you so have the equation of transfer, you have radiative heat transfer. So, basically, so these are what it, these are what are called the constitutive equations, the cons, constitutive relations in so far as the subject of heat transfer is concerned. These are general laws. So, every every subject will have a field of, will have some experts who take, who draw upon the basic laws of nature 
apply equations which are applicable to their media and then come out with the signs, but still it is all Newtonian physics. So, we can still say that heat transfer is still mechanics, mechanics and thermodynamics we want right, we are not still using, we are not still trying to solve the Schrodinger wave equation or quantum mechanics, of course in radiation you do that, most convective and convective heat transfer still it is Newtonian physics ok. So, the, we should not say this but the back end of the course everybody knows that there are three modes of heat transfer conduction through elementary particles convection is advection plus bulk motion but advection plus conduction radiation does not require a medium it is best in vacuum. So, some people skip point number 2 and say that there are only two modes of heat transfer conduction and radiation ok. So, elementary particles at high temperature regions at higher energy level oscillate. So, then there will be a microscopic movement of molecules. So, at a particular layer some molecules from top can come to the bottom from bottom they can come to the top, but there is a temperature difference. So, though the number of molecules coming from the top to the bottom or the bottom to the top microscopically even though there is no macroscopic movement is the same. The energy carried by the particles with the higher temperature is more compared to the energy carried by the particles with the lower temperature. Therefore, there is a net positive transfer of energy in the direction of decreasing temperature that is a mechanism of conduction which, which can be easily explained in the case of gases. You can also extend this to liquids for solids it is more difficult valence electrons and all those things will up and uh, will come into picture ok. So, if you look at energy transport by heat conduction that is the thing oscillation transfer to neighboring particles phenomena propagates through the medium right. What about the measurement of heat transfer? Why are we always talking about a measurement of temperature and not about measurement of heat flux? It is possible to construct heat flux gauges come up with the heat flux gauges and so on, but it is a lot easier to it is a lot easier to measure temperature because there are various ways of measuring temperature. You can use thermometer, thermocouple, thermistors, optical methods. One of my students is working on liquid crystal thermography ok. In liquid crystal thermography what you do is you have a sheet you have a sheet and paste it on the surface whose temperature is changing where there is a temperature distribution the the color of the sheet will change depending on the temperature. Then you take a picture in a high speed camera or a CCD camera then convert the colors to temperatures and then you get the temperature field from that you solve additional equations you solve inverse problems and so on that is liquid crystal thermography right. So, there are various temperature is a lot easier a lot easier to measure. So, then what we do is ok sometimes we want to know the temperature we want to know whether the temperature the maximum temperature in the laptop uh, respects the respects the standard set by the manufacturer I mean when I mean what I mean by respect the standards is ok if it is if it should not exceed 80 degree centigrade it should not 80 exceed 80 degree centigrade, but often times you are interested in the flux if you are interested in the flux what you have to do is you have to first measure the temperature and and link this temperature gradient to the heat transfer rate ok. So, this uh, through the Fourier's law of heat conduction when q, uh, q double prime put to minus k delta t ok. It is basically a rate law applicable to conduction it is not such a great law that it cannot be in the sense that it cannot be proved from first principles. Whenever conduction heat transfer takes place the heat transfer rate is always proportional to the temperature difference is inversely proportional to the area and if you replace a proportionality constant by inequality you get what is called the thermal conductivity. Therefore, the thermal conductivity of a medium is nothing but the heat flux and the gradient of the temperature is unity that is all. So, the Fourier's law of heat conduction gives you an operational definition for k, it, it gives you a way to measure k ok. So, when you are actually trying to measure the thermal conductivity in a lab did you do the thermal conductivity measurement? No, when you are actually trying to measure thermal conductivity in a lab you use what is called a garter hot plate apparatus, there are two plates they are maintained at different temperatures and then you send a certain amount of heat flux and find out the two temperatures ok or for the two temperatures what is the heat flux which is occurring. Then you take the delta T can be put as dt by dx or delta T by delta x you estimate the k. So, this simple this simple measurement of k what you are actually doing is you are solving an inverse problem ok because 
if you know the thermal conductivity you can take the conduction equation and and predict the temperature distribution or the temperatures at the two boundaries but what you are doing is ulta the reverse i i am giving you the two temperatures turn around and tell me the thermal conductivity so this is a very simple case where in a straightforward way you can get the k but if the k itself is of k itself is varies k x is different from k y is different from k z you require lot more work so this comes under the subject area of inverse heat transfer okay so this is the heat flux vector this is the thermal conductivity is a thermophysical property and t is the temperature so for metals the thermal conductivity is the order of 10 to the power of 2 okay for insulators it varies from 10 to the 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 1 gases it varies from 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 1 I'll give you a table. Okay, so thermal conductivity of selected materials, aluminium, uh, the pure aluminium is two is about 190 watt per meter per kelvin. Normally we use some aluminium alloy, so safely you can assume uh, usually around 200. Aluminium is around 200 watts per meter per kelvin. Copper has a terrific thermal conductivity, 390 watts per meter per kelvin. So as far as heat transfer is concerned, is uh, it's gold for us. Copper, copper is a benchmark in several cases, right? Copper cables, cop we use copper everywhere. It also, that's why it also gets stolen. That brass also gets stolen. The Indian Institute of Technology, the Indian was stolen because Indian can be easily resold. <laughs> the in gate, okay? Stolen. Main gate. Uh, huh? Let's see when. Okay, metal. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> so that is a story about metals. Steel. The thermal conductivity. The thermal conductivity of steel. Steel. I cannot put steel. There are so many types. You must have studied your metallurgy courses. You got mild steel, stainless steel, and high carbon steel, and so many low carbon steel. There are many varieties of steel. It's a ballpark or an approximate figure for 46 watts per meter kelvin. 46 watts per meter per kelvin. Non-metals. Cork is terrific. Cork is almost close to that of air, so it is an excellent insulator. Cork 0.042, thermal conductivity of air is 0.03, so it is almost close to air. But you can, I have put silicon basically because you should not be under the impression that any non metal will have very poor thermal conductivity. Silicon has a good thermal conductivity. Glass has around 2, 1.2, asbestos is 0.151, asbestos is now banned, correct? Because it is it is carcinogenic uh, asbestos you cannot use air air from kinetic theory of gases you know that the thermal conductivity of air will keep changing with temperature so this is for some particular temperature 297.026 carbon dioxide is 0.0167 o2 016 oxygen 0.02 hydrogen is 0.182 so if you see air co2 o2 they are all 0 0.0 something Okay, they are very poor conductors. So, the expression for heat flux is very important. So, so if this is your isotherm, that is your constant temperatures, right? I mean, so. 100, let us say 100 degree centigrade, 90 degree centigrade. At this point, you draw a tangent, so the heat flux vector will be like this. So, uh, sorry, what? Correct. The heat flux vector is normal to the, the heat flux vector is orthogonal to the isotherm. Okay. Let us take a simple problem. You just to illustrate the concept, concept. Huh? Let us say conduction in a plate, okay.
what should be the temperature here? It's a 1D problem, no heat generation, nothing, constant properties. What do you expect the temperature to be? 75. Okay, so this will be T of x. Okay, so isotherms are like this. It is not properly drawn, everything should be vertical. So, this is the 100 degree isotherm, 190, 80, 70, 50, 40, no, 190, 80, 75, 65, 60, 55. So, it should be like this. So, the heat flux vector is orthogonal to the isotherm. Okay. So, if you consider a problem. All of you have studied basic heat transfer, right? Let us consider a square slab. Correct? The governing equation is del square t equal to 0. What is this? Laplace equation. Suppose I say This wall is at 100. All the three walls are all the three walls are, are at zero degree centigrade. How will the isotherms look like? Isotherms. Uh -huh. Not other way. Hmm. Okay. So we'll start like this. Please follow me. The 100 degree isotherm is this, the 0 degree isotherm is this. All temperatures are between 0 and 100 in this problem, correct. So, the 90 degree isotherm will be like this, the 80 degree isotherm will be like this, 70, and finally, this fellow is 0, okay. So, 90, 80. Now, I leave it as an exercise to you. Please plot the iso heat flux lines on this because the heat flux lines have to be orthogonal to the isotherm. Okay? Fine. Hmm. We can discuss at the end of the class. So, the heat flux is evaluated like this orthogonal and the heat flux is a vector. Temperature is a temperature is a scalar, heat flux is a vector. So it has got three components q x, q y, and q z. So the q x is given by minus k dt by dx, minus k dt by dy, minus k dt by dz. Why is the minus coming? Ah, to take care of the fact that heat is always flowing from a high temperature to low temperature. Okay, so. This Q can be broken down as Q X I Q Y J Q K Q Z of uh, K, and where Q X Q Y Q Z are the heat flux components in the three directions, and it is given like this. So it is the components of the heat flux heat flux vector normal to the isothermal surface. Okay. So you can uh, so you can say that the D Q A is basically this is watts this is watts per meter square so the elemental heat transfer rate is equal to the flux into the elemental area so q can be replaced by k del t using the fourier's law and then therefore q must be integral dq over a then you can do this k into del t into n where n is a unit vector then for the special case of a rectangular slab if the temperature distribution is one dimensional that is t is a function only of x so this will become k dt by dx and if k is not a function of x, k can be taken outside. So, the q becomes minus k a dt by dx. Under the special case when the temperature distribution is linear, this can be written as k a delta t by delta x. Okay. So, this is a simple uh, expression which you have used. I think from high school onwards you have learned this. Okay. So, please note this very, very important. If the temperature is decreasing along x, then the heat is flowing from left to right. 
if the temperature profile is like this, heat is flowing from right to left. Hmm? So, you must get an idea of the direction. Okay? So, the direction is given by the second law of thermodynamics, which forbids flow of heat from a temperature from a low temperature to high temperature without the application without the aid of external work. So, please note this. So, dt by dx is less than 0, heat flow will be. Please remember this problem. Temperature is decreasing along x, therefore, heat must be flowing from left to right, and this is the exactly the opposite for the other case. Now, there are some materials which are anisotropic, okay. An isotropic material is one in which the thermal conductivity is independent of direction. That is thermal conductivity in x direction is the same as y is the same as z direction. If k x, k y, k z are function are dependent on the direction, it is called an anisotropic material. A homogeneous material on one on the other hand is a material in which the properties are independent of position. So, in this case, in this room, for example, if you take an air sample here and measure the density, and you can take an air sample there and measure the density, if the density is the same in both the places, then the air is homogeneous. Okay, but thermal conductive, but isotropic is if you are measuring a transport property with in x direction, y direction, z direction and you get different values, then it is anisotropic. Okay. Now, for anisotropic materials, for anisotropic materials q x, q y, q z each of these contains three components. Okay. So, you have q x is k x x d t by d x, k x y d t by d y and k x d t by d z like that the it follows for the other two. Now, so, the heat flux is related to the temperature gradient through something. This is called the thermal conductivity tensor. This is called the thermal conductivity tensor. Okay. It has got 9 components along the principal axis, main diagonal, you have got kx, ky, kz, and you have got because of symmetry kxy, kyz, kyx, kxz, kzx, and so on. So, it has got 6 elements which are to be determined, other 3 come by symmetry, right. It has to satisfy these properties k i j equal to k j i, k i i is greater than 0 and k i i k j j minus k i j square equal to 0. Therefore, it is a positive definite matrix, it is positive definite and why it has to be positive definite and all that basically comes from what is called the Onsagas principle. I cannot, I do not have time to do that, uh, that is uh, another important concept. Huh? Have you studied this? Because somebody will get a doubt, sir, why should be why should be like that? Why should k i i greater than should be greater than 0? Why should k i j be equal to k j i and so on? All these questions will be answered by uh, Onsaga's principle. It starts from the uh, uh, assumption that it starts from the basic uh, premise that you cannot violate the second law of thermodynamics and so on, right. When are these, where will this be important? Anisotropic media occur any laminated sheet, any laminated sheet basically is an anisotropic medium. Wood is anisotropic, transformer cores are many things where anisotropic media have to be studied. In fact, we are doing a project now for ISRO, Samarjit is working on that. So, ISRO wants the measurement of thermal conductivity, anisotropic thermal conductivity of a laminated sheet. Okay, right now, they are putting it into vacuum chamber and this thing and it takes a long time. So, we are suggesting some inverse technique and simultaneous estimation of these properties. So, it is it is not just of academic interest, it is very, very important. Now, the problem is the direction of heat flux is no longer normal to the isothermal surface throughout the point and uh, it is a lot more involved. Needless to say, there will be no further consideration of anisotropic media in this course. Okay. Now, this is the introduction to conduction. So, in the next class, we will start with the energy equation where the variable will be temperature, you will relate the temperature to the properties and you will get a differential equation, partial differential equation for temperature and then we will take simplifying conditions and reduce the equation and we will try to get as many analytical solutions as possible. Okay. Okay.